Chris Godinez, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday at noon here on YouTube, and then I post it up to Facebook. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. If you feel you need a therapist, please go to Google, type in therapy, your city, psychology today will pop up on that, click on that, and it will have all of your therapists in that area. Okay, uh, views and opinions stated here in her mind of mine alone, they do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other damn therapist for that matter. Boom, shakalaka, done. Okay, so a lot of people have been asking me, why are you having to sign in and all of that stuff? It is a YouTube thing, guys. It is a YouTube thing. They are forcing everyone to say whether their videos are kid-friendly or not. And since I swear like a motherfucker, they are not kid-friendly. So um, they are also demonetizing anybody who is not kid-friendly. So if you are so inclined, please go to Patreon. Let me see if I can get the, the website. Patreon.com slash we need to talk with Chris. All one word, we need to talk with Chris. If you are so inclined to support me over there, that would be great. Not necessary, but that would be great. Um, so there is that. And I do apologize. It is not anything I had anything to do with because I recognize a lot of people can't get that secondary confirmation because maybe their abusive spouse is watching their... Um, you know, their, their emails or wherever they're having you do the, the double thing. So if you're having a problem getting on to see this, please contact YouTube, please contact Google and let them know. Uh, okay. So, um, the topic today is how healthy relationships and how not to sabotage. So before I get into that, one other little thing I wanted to make sure to tell you guys, I cannot counsel people in other states. I wish I could. I can't. So I am limited to Arizona. I cannot do phone counseling. I cannot do Skype counseling. I cannot do any of that. But I can tell you who can. That would be Miss Susanna Quintana at SusannaQuintana.com. And she does a free uh, introductory kind of session thing as well. So if you are in need of somebody to help you through an abusive relationship, you're out of the relationship or you're just about to get out of the relationship and you need somebody to help you plow through those emails that your ex is sending you like crazy, Susanna is an expert in this. She has been there, done that, and she knows how to weed through all the crap in those emails to get to the heart of whatever needs to be answered without feeding the <laughs> feeding the monster. So SusannaQuintana.com, that's your girl, okay? All right, good, got that. All right, healthy relationships. Yay! We've been talking about what is unhealthy and all the signs of an unhealthy relationship. So let's start talking about what are the signs of a healthy relationship. And I pulled about three or four um, articles off the off of uh, Psychology Today and Huffington Post and other places that are great. And I want to talk about them. And I want to do a contrast and compare. And this is another reason why I'm upset with YouTube, because honest to God, teenagers need to be hearing this. Teenagers who are dating need to hear what are the healthy relationship signs and how not to sabotage them and things like that. I mean, we know what an, a, an abusive relationship looks like, but what does a healthy relationship look like? And part of the reason why we don't know is oftentimes we have been in you know, family systems, family of origin systems that were just so dysfunctional. It's like if you, we wouldn't recognize normal if it walked up and did the Watusi with us, which I'm pretty sure probably has. So it's really, really important that we know what a healthy relationship is. So let us dive right into it. And if you guys have questions, you know, hold off on them until the, the half an hour and then we'll start doing questions. But please, please, please write them down and then send them in and, and we'll get them, we'll get to them at the half an hour. All right. So here is one of the signs, and this is from Psychology Today. I pulled it off of Psychology Today. Here's one of the signs of a healthy relationship. You and your partner are on the same page in terms of basic values and life goals. So one thing that abusers will do is they will suck you into a relationship and then suddenly they're not aligned with all of your life goals and your things. So say, for example, you want children. All of a sudden they don't or they've never talked about it, or they keep dodging the topic. So you need to make sure that when you are dating in a healthy relationship, these things get discussed. Sex gets discussed. Having kids gets discussed. Life goals get discussed. So hello, communication, communication, communication. So think of a relationship like a good real estate deal. Instead of location, 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 it's going to be communication, communication, communication. So your goals are aligned. You're on the same path. Now, remember though, in the beginning of a, an abusive relationship, they love bomb. 
And so they're like, oh, you like pizza? I like pizza. You like mousse? I like mousse. You like ice skating? I like ice skating. They do all of that. So you're going to have to really pay attention to if and when, if they're abusive, the mask slips and suddenly their goals are not on the same page. If they're not on the same page, abort, 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 get out of there. Okay. Because you're going to regret it. You're going to regret it. If you get involved with somebody that says at first, oh, yes, I want children, or no, I don't want children, and then they change their mind, and then you either have kids against your gut instincts or don't have kids against your gut instincts, you're going to regret it. You're just going to regret it. So goals are aligned. You talk about it frequently. It is it is more conversation and more communication, not less. Okay. Um, okay. And you're firmly committed to achieving these goals together. So you're on the same page. Number two, there is a strong sense of trust between you. You openly discuss everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. There is no hidden agenda and no secrets. Okay. Now in an unhealthy relationship, the abuser gets you to tell everything and then they tell very little or nothing of themselves. So it is an equal sharing and it's not immediate. It's not like you meet the person and, oh my God, you're sharing everything. No, 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 no. Healthy relationships take their time. They are slow. They are like glacierly slow because you want to get to know the person. Now, an, a disordered person, somebody with a personality disorder is not going to be able to handle the slow pace. They want it now, 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 now. So be aware of that. Okay. So hang on back to this. Oh God. Old age is so fabulous. Can't see shit. What the hell? Um, okay. So there's no hidden agendas. Trust is everything guys. Trust is everything. If there is no trust, there is no relationship. So trust is earned. It is not just given. You have to earn it, which means no lying, no game playing, no, no bullshit, no, none of that stuff. So trust is being consistent. Trust is being open and honest. Trust is being who you are in public in private and one-on-one. -on -one. That is who you are. So basically what you see is what you get. So, which is why I'm not child friendly. Um, so anyway, I'm a little bitter about that. Can you tell? Anyway, so the point being is, is that trust is earned. It is not just given. And once somebody lies to you, it's like a mirror getting cracked. You know, you can still see your reflection in that mirror, but boy, how do you still see that crack there? And it's really, really hard to rebuild trust or regain trust once trust has been broken, which is why you must be true to your word. You must be authentic. You must be real. And if you fuck up, yo, my bad. Clean up on aisle two. I did that. I hurt you. I apologize. And it will never happen again. And then it never happens again. So you must be a person of your word. Your word must be your bond. Okay. Um, if you're not as good as your word, then you're worth nothing. You know, it's like if people can't trust you. Then what's the point? So there we go. So trust is everything in a relationship. Okay. Hang on in a healthy relationship. All right. Um, there's a strong sense of trust between the two of you. You openly discuss everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's no hidden agendas. Okay. You keep your own identity and the relationship within the relationship. And so does your partner. So here's what happens in abusive relationships the target of abuse loses their identity. They become the abuser. So if the abuser is interested in something or if you're interested in something, the abuser suddenly is interested in what you're doing and becomes that. So it's like this weird losing your identity kind of thing. It's like, wait a minute, I thought that painting was my big thing, but now you're telling me that painting is your big thing and that I need to stop so that you can focus in on your painting or vice versa. So we lose our identity. We stop becoming an individual person and suddenly we are the partner. Okay. No, 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 no. In a healthy relationship, your partner has their identity. You have your identity. You go do your own things with your own friends. You go do your own jobs. You go do whatever, but then you come together and talk about it and have fun and, and share and have mutual friends. And then you also have your own friends. So in an unhealthy relationship, there is no separation because remember borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder, when they are malignant, when they are malignant guys, I get so tired of people going, you're talking about me and I'm not that way. Well, then I'm not talking about you. Am I Jesus Christ? I'm talking about malignant. Jesus. Anyway, the point being is 
if there is a personality disorder, there is no boundary. There is no boundary. They cannot tell where we begin and end and they begin and end because they don't know who they are. So there is no boundary. So you want to watch for individualization. That's a healthy relationship. They go do their own thing. You go do your own thing. It's all good. See where I'm going with that? Okay. Hang on. All right. Um, this is so vital. Marriage may be a large piece of the whole pie that identifies who you are, but above all, you are still you and are an individual beyond your various roles in life. And that's hundred percent true. Okay. Number five, you encourage each other to grow and change. In other words, you inspire each other to be the better person, to be the best you that you can be. So in a healthy relationship, a healthy partner is not threatened by you trying something new or switching careers or uh, deciding you want to skydive or, you know, whatever. It's like the healthy partners go, go you. That's fabulous. I personally don't want to jump out of a perfectly good working plane, but hey, I'll watch you from on the ground. You know, that kind of thing. What a disordered partner does is they stop you. They don't want you to succeed. They truly do not. They say they do. Mm, motherfuckers. They say they do. They're like, oh, I really want you to be successful. But then they fucking, you know, slash your tires, so to speak. You know, they keep you from moving forward. They don't want you to get the good job or pursue your hobbies because God forbid, what if you're better than they are? So a healthy partner, healthy partner, healthy partner encourages you, says, go you, go do that. Go do that hobby. Go do that career. Go back to school. Yes, absolutely. Let's, we'll figure it out. We'll make it work somehow. Okay. So healthy partners encourage each other to grow. Or here's the other thing. They encourage each other to go to therapy. You know, if there is a problem, if there is something going on, go to a therapist and the partner is not threatened by that. But what an unhealthy partner does is, well, what did you talk about in therapy? What did you, were you talking about me? You were talking about me, weren't you? I want to know everything that was said in your therapy session. That is what unhealthy partners do. Healthy partners go, good. Did you have a good session? Great. End of discussion. And you encourage your partner to go and become the better them that they can possibly be, be the best them that they can be. And they encourage us to be the best us that we can possibly be. So, you know, when I started on this journey, John has been the most amazing support ever. He's been like, yeah, do this. Yeah, this is important. Yeah. You know, and this takes an hour out of our Sundays. I don't get to spend this hour with him. I'm spending it with you. And he's okay with that. And I'm okay with that. And we support each other. Okay. Like he goes off and does his uh, saxophone and his uh, trombone. He belongs to two orchestras. And I'm like, good, go. This is awesome. And then I go and see his concerts when he does that. So, you know, and then he helps me with the admin on this. So, you know, it's that's what healthy is, people. It's not a fucking competition. In an unhealthy relationship, it's a competition. In a healthy relationship, relationship. It's a, oh, let's grow. This is awesome. Go you, go me. This is awesome. It's like helping each other be the best us we can be. Okay. There is that. All right. Hang on. Boop. All right. Number, where am I? Whoa. Number six, you and your partner feel safe, safe, communicating personal needs and wants. Time is set aside to discuss issues relevant to you as a couple or to each of you individually. Listening carefully with undivided attention is essential to real understanding. So what abusers will do is they will have their phone. Let's see it. I have my phone right here. And it, oh, did it, did it, did it, did it, did it, did it. And they're not listening. It's, hey, yeah, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, yeah. Mm, flip, flip, flip. No, 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 no. That is not a healthy relationship. Healthy relationship is undivided, one-on-one. -on -one, hi, I'm here. I'm present. There is a wonderful video. I, I think I posted it on my um, uh, LPC page, the uh, public speaker page. So that's where I post videos that I think are interesting or political stuff or cats or dogs or houses or Victorian dresses, you know, that's the thing. Um, but there's a video that I posted on there about uh, the artist is present. So it's it was this artist that was in this red dress and she was just sitting there and she would have people come up for one minute and just sit with her and she would open her eyes and then she would sit. Well, her ex-boyfriend came and sat in front of her and so that they just stared at each other for a whole minute. It's the most beautiful thing ever. Anyway, but that's being present. 
just being with the person, not distracted, not, you know, looking over here or up over there, whatever, being with the person, that is a healthy relationship. One-on-one, -on -one, hello, I am present. The person is present. The artist is present. The partner is present. Does that make sense? So there is that. And you're not afraid to talk. So when you're in an abusive relationship or you've been in an abusive relationship, we very quickly get scared of real, real, honest to God emotions, real, honest to God communication. Why? Because our abusers always shut us down when we had real, honest to God communication and real, honest to God emotions. They didn't like it. They didn't like it. So in a healthy, 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 healthy relationship, you can say what you are feeling. I feel angry, hurt, sad, disappointed, disrespected, uh, you know, et cetera, when this behavior happens and you're not afraid of being punished. Now, in an unhealthy relationship, what will happen? The abuser will start flipping it around on you, word salad, and they'll start raging. Let me clue you into something. Healthy relationships do not have rage. They do not have rage. They do not, not have rage. They don't. They just don't. You can have anger, to be sure but you're not raging at somebody doing word salad, not making sense. It, yeah, that does not happen. If that is happening in your relationship, again, abort, 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 get the fuck out. You're in danger, okay? Rage is not normal. And unfortunately, if we've been raised in an abusive household, we get taught that that's a normal communication skill. That is not a normal communication skill. So this is why therapy is hugely important for us to make sure that we have got good communication skills, using I statements, using getting rid of the you, 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 you guns. If there's you, 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 you guns, it is not a healthy relationship. If there's word salad, it's not a healthy relationship. If there's fear, obligation, or guilt, fog, it is not a healthy relationship. Okay. So, and you're not afraid to communicate. You're not afraid to speak your feelings. You're not. And if you are, it's either because of a past relationship or you're involved with an abuser. So, all right, there is that. All right. You respect each other's differences, even if you disagree on important issues, and you are able to turn your differences into a fair compromise. Healthy relationships are not a win-lose situation. Let me say that again. Healthy relationships are not a win-lose, I win, you lose situation, or you win, I lose. It's uh-uh. No, 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 no. Healthy relationships are all about compromise, guys. It's all about getting uh, the most needs met that we possibly can. May not be 100%, but we're still moving towards the same goal. With a narcissist, with an abuser, it is always a win-lose situation because they're always in competition and they have to win. Have to win. Even over toilet paper. They will argue over which way you put the toilet paper. I don't give a fuck as long as there's toilet paper. Do you see where I'm going with that? So it's like, because that's the worst feeling in the world. Don't get me started. All right. So no, seriously. So like they will argue over anything and everything to be right. They need to be right. They need to win. It's a win for them. And in reality, in a healthy relationship, it's a, okay, we're disagreeing on this. I like the toilet paper one way. You like the toilet paper the other way. Let's just agree that as long as there's toilet paper, it's all good. You know, it's, or, or we'll flip, well, flip it around, you know, flip it around and make it happy for you. I don't care. <laughs> Do you see where I'm going with it? It's like, it's toilet paper. It's not an arm. It's not a leg. Nobody's dying. Can we compromise on this? Do you see where I'm going with that? It's a compromise, making sure that both parties are happy. Okay. But not giving up on true, really good, you know, like, uh, uh moral stuff. So like if your abuser says, oh, well, everybody lies, you should lie. Uh-uh. Uh-uh, bitch, I'm not going to lie. Not everybody lies. Hate to break it to you. White lies to save somebody's feelings? Yeah, sure. Major lies to cover your ass? Wrong! So, yeah, there that is. Okay, I'm on a roll today. Jesus, crying. Okay, number eight, you share realistic expectations for the relationship, not what you wish or fantasize it should be. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. So, healthy relationships acknowledge what is. 
Okay. It acknowledges what is, okay. We're not millionaires. We're not living in Bel Air. We're not, you know, driving a Rolls Royce or whatever the fuck the fancy cars are. You know, we, we live within our means. We recognize that we both work and we're going to have date nights maybe once or twice a month. You know, we're not living in a fantasy world of, well, but I want what the Kardashians want. Well, the Kardashians have got a shit ton of money. I don't know that many people that have that much money. In fact, I don't know anybody that has that kind of money. So do you see where I'm going with that? So you deal with what is. What abusers do is they live in magic thinking. I want, I wish, I want it this way. I wish it was this way. Da, 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 da. And then they keep trying to make their reality the reality, but then it never really works. So they're always unhappy. So you got to deal with somebody who's a realist. You want somebody who's like, yeah, this is the situation. Here it is. And, you know, we're just going to deal with it. We'll make the best of it. You know, it's like, I hate to say it, but it's like, when life hands you lemons, you either make lemon meringue pie or lemonade or do something else with them iced tea. I don't know, you know, or, or, you know, and you, you do the best you can with what you got basically. But what a narcissist does is if it's not perfect, Oh, sweet baby Jesus, you're in for an earful. Well, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. Well, fuck, you No, the world is not perfect. If it was Jesus, so much would be different. Oh my God. Anyway, the point being, so you want somebody who is a realist. Okay. Somebody who is, you know, not magic thinking. So deals with what is, uh, okay, number nine, each of you contributes to your fair share of the relationship, whatever that happens to be. Each partner brings their best strengths and ability to benefit the team. So what you will find in an unhealthy relationship is that the narcissist refuses to work. They refuse. They just, nope, it's beneath me. I'm not going to do it. I want a possession. Oh, good God. Are we already going to minute to questions in eight minutes? Okay, we'll get your questions together. I'm going to have to do a part two on this. Um, so what the narcissists do is they're like, I'm not going to do dishes. I'm not going to vacuum. I'm not going to clean the cat litter. I'm not going to pick up the dog poop. I'm not going to, it's beneath me. No bullshit motherfucker. You know, if you're in a relationship, you fucking work for the good of the whole. There is no I in team. I know you hate hearing that, but I swear to God, it's true. So, you know, it's like you're working through the whole. Okay. It's like if, if there's dishes in the sink, whoever happens to be around does the dishes. If cat litter needs cleaning. Who You know, you both clean it out. If you need dog poop picked up, you pick up the dog poop. If the place needs vacuuming, you get it vacuumed. But what a narcissist does is... Ugh, that's beneath me. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to work. I'm not going to blah, 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 blah. Okay. All right. Hang on. There's more. I'm going to try to get through as many of these as I can. All right. Uh, number 10, you and your partner honor each other's family ties and friendships. While it's important to set aside time for family and friends, it's also important to maintain healthy boundaries between you and your partner as a unit apart from other close relationships. So basically in a healthy relationship, each partner has got friends and they hang out with them and they've got their own family and they hang out with them. When an abuser comes on the scene, they isolate. You can't hang out with that person. You can't hang out with that sister or that brother or that person or that cousin or whatever. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. So in an unhealthy relationship, the target starts getting isolated. In a healthy relationship, it's like, yeah, go hang out with your girlfriends. Yeah, go hang out with your boyfriends. Go hang out with your friends. Go hang out with your cousins. Go hang out with your sister. Go hang out with your brother. Go hang out. Go hang out. Go hang out. Go hang out. Go be. Go do. But you also have really good boundaries between you and the family. So just in case the family has got issues, okay, you're able to go, eh, nope, sorry, we're not going to come over for Thanksgiving dinner or nope, sorry, we're not going to come over for, you know, uh, Sunday brunch or whatever. We got other plans, you know, and you're on the same team. So that's really important. Um, caring, wah, kindness. Oh, my eyes, dear God. Support, encouragement, and empathy are the watchwords of a good and loving relationship. There is simply no room for rudeness, meanness, jealousy, insults, degrading, blaming, guilting, criticizing, judging, or physically acting out, especially when the object is one's partner. Those boundaries cannot be crossed. And that's very, very true. So what is interesting to me is that abusers absolutely refuse to change. They refuse to uh, do any of the good, healthy behaviors. 
But the other part of it is, and this is what I want to talk about really quickly because I've got about six minutes on this, is that we have a tendency to sabotage healthy relationships. Why? Because we're not used to it. We're not used to it. We're not, we're used to all the crap. We're used to the competition and the blaming, the shaming, the guilt tripping, the name calling, the degrading, the this, that, and the other thing, because that's what we've been either raised with, or those are who we've dated. So, which is probably having something to do with who we were raised with. But here's the thing. It's like when we get into a healthy relationship, this is why it's vital. You work on your self-esteem, self-esteem workbook, Glenn Schiraldi, self-esteem workbook, Glenn Schiraldi. Disease to Please, Harriet Breaker, okay? Inner Child Workbook, Katherine Taylor. These are vital. CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. Why? Because our subconscious is going to get involved with somebody healthy and it's going to go, oh, this is, wait, this is nothing like my family. Wait, no, this is nothing like I've ever dated before. Wait, no, this, I don't even know how to do this. So we suffer from a better the devil you know than the devil you don't which is no bueno. So our inner child starts running the show. And before you know it, you're doing stupid things. So let me give you an example. So when, when John and I got together, um, I had come off of a very abusive relationship, then got into a slightly healthier relationship. Then I met John and we started dating just as friends. Okay. And we dated as friends platonically for two whole years. Cause I was so terrified of getting involved in another bad relationship. Well, finally on a date, we went and saw Dracula, the Keanu Reeves one, and um, he kissed me and I freaked out. I freaked out. I freaked the fuck out. I'm no kidding. Like full on freak out. And I looked at him and I'm like, I want to date other people. And he was like, okay, because <laughs> he's so cool. And of course I never dated other people and we've been together since 1992. We got married in 96. So, but it's like you freak out because you're not used to it. And the inner child pops up and goes, ah, I don't know how to handle this. I don't know how to be like this. I don't know. You know, I know, I know how to hide. I know how to kind of sort of manipulate so that I can stay safe. I know how to fill in the blank with the dysfunctional behavior, but I don't know how to be in a healthy relationship. In a healthy relationship, your partner is going to be willing for you to go to therapy. They're going to be willing for them to go to therapy and they're going to be willing for the two of you to go to therapy. So in a healthy relationship, when things start getting wonky, a healthy relationship actually goes to therapy before critical mass. Okay. The reason why everybody says, Oh, marital counseling doesn't work is because they wait until critical mass. They wait until China syndrome Okay, before they go get help. And of course, a narcissist never wants to go to a therapist, or if they do, they want to try to manipulate the therapist and they'll go one, maybe three times, and then they'll peace out. As soon as the therapist goes, and what is your part in this? Boop, they're gone. Plus, the fact you never want to go to therapy with an abuser ever. It's dangerous. They will use it against you. And Dwayne and I talked about that when I did a show with him last week, which he will be getting up, guys. I promise. He's gonna be. He's gonna break it down into segments because we ended up talking for like an hour and a half because you get the two of us together and it's like. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so ah, okay. Questions in two minutes. So get your questions together. So okay. So in. A therapy session, when you have a healthy partner and things get wonky, let's say the communication skills are off or something's happening, you go at the first sign of trouble. You do not wait until the relationship is just about to tank. That is what people's big mistake is. Similar to if you break a bone, you don't wait a year, six months, two months to go see the doctor. You go see a doctor immediately and you get it reset so it doesn't grow back funky donkey you know, and have to be rebroken and straightened and everything else. So that is the big mistake that people make. So, okay. So quickly, before we get into um, the questions, please go visit my Patreon page. Like I said, uh, YouTube has decided to defund anything that is not child friendly. And I am certainly not child friendly. and I'm not going to pretend that I am. So uh, if you're interested in that, please go to the Patreon page. We need to talk with uh, patreon.com slash we need to talk with Chris. Um, and if you feel so inclined, please feel free to contribute there. Please share the heck out of this video because I think, honest to God, I think teenagers need to hear this. I think teenagers need to hear what a healthy relationship is. I really, really do. Um, also, too, Susanna Quintana, guys. Susanna Quintana is your girl. So I cannot counsel you guys across state lines. I cannot do Skype. I cannot do phone. If you're in Arizona, 
I will need to see you in person first, and then we can do phone sessions as long as you are in Arizona. Um, so there is that. So SusannaQuintana.com. She's amazing. And she is an expert in narcissistic relationships because she's been there, done that. And if you're going through a divorce, this is your girl, guys, because she can help you plow through all the emails and take care of that stuff. Okay. So questions. Okay. Let's do this. Hang on. And ooh, where is my, there it is. Scrolling, scrolling. Okay. All right. Question. My boyfriend wants kids and I don't. He jokingly, bunny ears, tells me he will change my mind about kids. Is that a red flag? Yes. So listen, guys, if you don't want kids, you don't want kids. If you do want kids, you do want kids. You generally know. OK, um, so if this is a serious thing and you're like, yeah, no, I, I don't want kids, then him changing your mind. How? You know, I mean, getting you pregnant and then you have a kid and then then what? You know, you don't want. To, here's the deal. People have children for all the wrong goddamn reasons. And as much as I'm not crazy about Dr. Phil, he did say one thing that I really agreed with. When people have a child to save the relationship, they've already given that child a job. That child hasn't even been conceived yet. And they've already given that child a job. How fucking unfair is that? So, you know, if you don't want kids, you don't want kids. So, you know, it, it's kind of like a, wait a minute, this is, this is serious. I don't want children. And be very sure, you know, because we do change over time and things like that. But generally when somebody is like, nah, it's not for me, they know, you know, I raised or helped raise a lot of my nieces and nephews you know, great nieces, great nephews. And I just, I got my maternal stuff out. And I never wanted children. I just don't, I love them, but I just never wanted my own. Plus the fact I looked at my family history and I went, huh, schizophrenia on my mom's side with my uncle. Ooh, not good. Hmm. Grandmother on also my mom's side. I'm seeing a pattern here. Shot the arm off. Great grandmother shot the arm off of my great grandfather. Okay. You know, homicidal tendencies and schizophrenia. Oh, not good. You know, and then on my dad's side, my great grandmother was completely insane. I'm guessing borderline based on what I've heard in family stories. So, you know, I'm just going to like, you know what? Oh, and then on my husband's side, there's also violence. And I went, you know what? I'm just, no. <laughs> I, dogs. I'm good with dogs. Love my dogs. Dog. I have one now. But, you know, so that is something serious. That is not a you, I will change your mind thing. It's like you either know it or you don't. You know, it's, yeah, no, that's kind of a red flag. That's kind of a red flag. I think that would need more discussion and possibly going to a therapist and really deciding because if he's hell bent on having kids and you are hell bent on not, neither one of you are going to be happy. Okay. If you give into one or you give into the other, there's going to be regrets. So be careful of that. How long do you recommend being in a healthy relationship before making a permanent commitment? At least a year. I know everybody's looking at me going, what? So here's the deal, guys. In an abusive relationship, they move lightning speed, lightning speed, lightning speed, lightning speed. They've, you've gone out three times already, your boyfriend and girlfriend. You've gone out four times and they want to move in. You've gone out five times and they want a commitment. You know, I mean, so we're used to lightning speed, lightning speed, lightning speed, lightning speed, lightning speed. No, take your time. Now, what do you mean by a permanent commitment? That's, you know, what does that mean? Does that mean boyfriend and girlfriend? Does that mean you're not dating other people? Does that mean you're moving in together? Does that mean you're getting married? What does that mean? So let's say you meet somebody. Okay. This is how a healthy relationship goes. Oh, 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 see, yeah, see I got to do a part two of this because there is so much to talk about in a healthy courtship guys. It is not over the top. It is not over the top. It's coffee. You go out for coffee and you talk and you learn who each other are and you do that for a while and then you move up to maybe dinner okay and then you move up to like you know miniature golf and then maybe bowling and then you know and just see where I'm going with it you don't want to do movies because you're not talking you're just watching a screen so you know you don't want to do that but you want to you want to take your time and you want to really learn who that person is now because I was so gun shy I, it took me two years with John because we were just friends. We were just totally nothing, you know, no hanky panky was going on. Um, because I was very scared of getting involved with another abuser. And so, you know, at least a year, take your time. And if they're pushing, that's a huge red flag, 
huge red flag. A healthy, normal person is going to honor that slow paced time period. What abusers do is boom, 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 boyfriend, girlfriend, moving in, married, kids, this, that. And sometimes kids come first. So I've seen it where abusers will trap, especially if it's a guy and it's the female is the abuser, trap the guy into a relationship and they've been dating like a month or two, you know, and then suddenly there's a kid. So yeah, it, Downton Abbey did a really good job of, of portraying that on season four with uh, Tom. I was just like, oh, that maid has got personality disorder. Isn't that interesting? So anyway, um, so you want to take your time. You want to take your, it goes slow. There are no over the top love bombing things. There's not like the first date is Disneyland, like literally Disneyland or some expensive vacation going alone somewhere. No, 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 no. We're talking like small town, coffee shop, going out for lunch, you know, that kind of thing, getting to, going for walks, getting to know each other. That is what that is. And you take your time. You really, honest to God, take your time. If it's moving fast, then there's a reason why. And it's, that's a huge red flag, huge, ginormous red flag. Okay, next question. So, um, and as far as marrying is concerned, minimum, minimum of two years, minimum. If you want to see them in every single situation that you possibly can. You want to see them with their family. How do they act around their family? How do they act on vacation? How do they act when they're stressed out? How do they act when they don't get their way? How do they act when things don't go their way? This is why you've got to take your time because you need to see them in different situations to see whether the mask slips or not. You know, everybody gets stressed to be sure when things don't go right. Yeah, you get stressed, but with an abuser, they, they take it to the next level. They're just like, you know, angry and pissed and this and that and da, da, da. I mean, you can be irritated and annoyed. Yeah, for sure. But a narcissist will show the, show their true colors basically. So that's why you want to take your time. Go very slow. I mean like glacierly slow. And if the person is healthy, they'll be okay with it. If not, they're going to be like, hey, baby, come on. Hey, come on. Hey, come on. Hey, come on. And this is the thing. What I've seen with abusers is when I ask all of the targets of abuse, how long did it take? How long did it take before you guys were mm, 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 committed, right? Three dates. Three dates. And the reason why abusers do that is because they want to get the oxytocins going. They want to get that bonding chemical going. They want to jump into the bed because then they can get the oxytocins going and get you hooked. That's what they're looking for. So you want to make it last as long as you possibly can. Anticipation is great because then when you guys finally do have sex, it's going to be awesome, hopefully. So you know what I'm saying? So yeah, and there is no shaming in the bedroom either. Narcissists will shame you. Narcissists will uh, damn you for being too sexual because you're really enjoying it, or they'll damn you for not enjoying it enough or whatever. So yeah, those are all red flags, guys. See, this is why we need to make this into a part two because I got so much to say. So, okay. So there is that. All right. Now, I hope that answered the question. So you want to take your time. Take your time. Take your time. Better to go too slow and then need to speed it up a little bit a little later on than to dive into it and get totally hooked by one of these piranhas and be eaten alive. So, okay, how do you fit children into a healthy relationship? Should the child come first most of the time? Children always come first. Always, 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 always. And here's the reason why. Hang on. Excuse me. These are also available. They're in white from the Mercury store. So mercury.com slash shop, I think is what the thing is. So, um, and I forgot to talk about the cruise. Oh my God. So we're still doing the cruise. I'll talk about that at the end. Anyway, um, how do you fit children to a healthy relationship? The children come first. Your children are always your first priority. However, it's balance. Okay. It's not, you know, you know, this it's, balanced. You're balancing it. If your partner is jealous of your children, you are with an abuser. If your partner is making a fit about you spending time with your children, they've got issues. They're, they've got like insecurity issues. What the fuck? You know, so the kids 
are, you know, it should be a balance. It should be like, you know, equal balance. It's like the kids are important, your partner's important. What happens with us though, is that when we get involved with an abuser, we put everything on the back burner. Friends go on the back burner. Family goes on the back burner. Relationships other than the, the abusive one go on the back burner. The hobbies go on the back burner. Sometimes the jobs go on the back burner. And we put the abuser first because making them happy keeps us safe. And that is the wrong thing to do. So in a healthy relationship, the kids are are equal. You know, it's like it's not like, eh, eh, you know, none of that. It's like but they come first as far as their being safe is concerned, if that makes any sort of sense. So the children are, when you're in a healthy relationship, you do not introduce your kids to this person until you know it is serious. Okay. This is where kids get screwed up so easily is that the person gets involved in another relationship super quick and they immediately introduce them to the other person. Oh, this is uncle so-and-so, or this is aunt so-and-so, or, you know, whatever, this is your new mom or your new dad or whatever. This is what abusers do. And it's too fast. And the kid has got, you know, a hundred thousand million people coming and going as their new mom, their new dad, or their uncle, this, or their aunt, that. And that's really confusing for a kid. And you don't want to do that. So you only, only introduce the children when it is clear that the object is matrimony and you guys are going to be living together and you are going to be cohabitating. And, you know, you take your time, take your time, take your time. And the children are going to be, you know, especially if your ex is an abuser, they're going to be hearing a bunch of crap from the ex about how horrible this new person in their life is, you know? So you want to make sure the kids are in therapy. You want to make sure that you're having good, open, honest communication. Okay. Okay. And you listen to them. I cannot tell you the number of times that somebody has dived out of one abusive relationship right into another one. Then the kids start getting abused, but they refuse to believe the kids because they want to believe the abuser because they're more interested in having a relationship than they are in having a healthy child. So, yeah, there is that. Okay. How do you do constructive criticism with a partner? Okay. So what you do is... You get uh, fighting for your marriage. I do not know who wrote it. It's on Amazon. It's all communication skills. So you get used to doing I statements and you get used to doing reflective listening. So reflective listening is when somebody, one person talks and you keep it very short. The other person listens and then the person reflects back what they've heard. Now, very often what happens in dysfunctional relationships is the person does not hear the message clearly. They get into their own head and they've suddenly decided all sorts of stuff. So let's say that, the, you know, you, this person goes, I feel disrespected when the dishes aren't done. Okay. Let's just use that as an example, housework. Okay. So in a healthy relationship, this person would go, okay, what I heard you say is that you feel disrespected when the dishes aren't done. Is that correct? And this person goes, yes. And then the conversation moves forward about, you know, how to let's, let's divvy up the schedule or I'll make sure and do the dishes, you know, when I see them, or we'll, we'll figure out how to make sure this is fair, et cetera. Okay. In an unhealthy relationship, I feel disrespected when the dishes aren't done. You think I'm a terrible person and you think I'm a horrible spouse and you, 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 you flipping it. I do all of this for you. And I do all of that for you. And word salad, not making sense. Do you see where I'm going with that? So when you do constructive criticism, you always frame it as an I statement. I feel what is the emotion? I feel the emotion, angry, sad, hurt, disrespected when the behavior happens. So notice nowhere in that sentence was the word you, because what happens is as soon as somebody hears the word you, we all go, La, 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 fuck you, la, 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 I'm not listening, la, 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 and we're in our heads. So you want to stick to I statements. I feel angry, hurt, sad, disrespected, confused um, when this behavior happens. And then hopefully they'll reflect back. Okay, I hear you. You feel disrespected when the dishes aren't done. Is that right? Yes, that is. Okay, well, let's let's figure out a schedule or let's figure out how we can make this fair. So you, when you do constructive criticism, constructive criticism is always with the goal of finding a solution. Destructive criticism is name calling, putting down, uh, shaming, blaming, guilting, 
uh, do, getting into an argument for the sake of getting into an argument, those are deconstructive. Those are, those are how to hurt arguments, right? Constructive criticism is vocalizing what you are feeling, taking ownership and responsibility for what you are feeling. I feel disrespected when the dishes don't get done. You're talking about the behavior, not the person. You're not condemning the person. So you're a horrible person for not doing the dishes. No, we're not saying that. I feel sad or disrespected when the dishes don't get done. It's a totally new way of talking. It slows everything way down and we're not used to that. Why? Because in an unhealthy relationship, we are used to bam, 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 and off and running and then screaming and yelling and raging and slamming doors and, and threatening to leave and all that crap. <coughs> in a healthy relationship, the goal of any communication, especially when there is some sort of constructive criticism involved, is solution, is compromise, is being heard and understood. That's the goal. It's not a competition, guys. It's not a competition. So you stick to I statements, I feel, whatever the emotion is, when, whatever the behavior is, happens. And then your partner will reflect back what they heard if they don't get it right. If they do the whole word salad or you think I'm a horrible person, stop. That's not what I said. Let me try again. And then you try again. And of course, you have to tell your partner ahead of time, this is what I'm going to do from here on out. So that they're not like, what the fuck are you doing? So have them read uh, Fighting for Your Marriage. I don't know who wrote it, but Fighting for Your Marriage. It's a great book. I recommend it to all my couples. Um, the other thing of it is, too, is that a lot of times there's a lot of miscommunication about love languages. So I'm not a fan of the book, but I do love the whole idea of the, of the love languages. So what is your love language? What is their love language? They need to speak your love language and you need to speak their love language. And that's how people feel loved. So if one person is, okay, so the five love languages are uh, acts of service, words of affirmation, gift giving, quality time, and physical touch, right? So if one person's love language is physical touch, but the other person's love language is acts of service, and this person's always mowing the lawn and this one's always trying to jump their bones, neither one of them are gonna feel loved. So you have to talk the other's love language so that they understand, they get that you get them. So super important. Okay, so I hope that answered that question on constructive criticism. My mother called up my fiance's family and invited all of his family to our wedding. Okay. My mother called up my fiance's family and invited all of his family to our wedding. Okay, duh, sorry. Uh, they have been breaking boundaries and I'm freaking out. What do I do? Holy crap. Well, she overstepped her boundaries. I, I don't know what your mother was thinking. Um, and it's probably too late to uninvite them. Uh, although you could. You could, it would piss a lot of people off and it would be drama up the wazoo. Um, I wanna know why your mom felt she had the right to do that. That would be really interesting. I don't know what your relationship is with her. I don't know if it's abusive. Some parents are bridezillas. They try to take over the daughter's wedding or the son's wedding. And uh, they try to do all this sort of stuff. Um, they've been breaking boundaries. Well, so what you do is you let all of the people know what you're not going to put up with and you have somebody assigned to each of them or to each group. So I kind of had to do that in my wedding as well. It's like if so-and-so acts out, they are to be escorted off, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you may want to have a chat with your mom and ask her why the hell she did that. Um, your mom may be sabotaging uh, a lot of you know, disordered parents do that. I don't know if she's disordered. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know. Um, you could elope. You could, uh, you could uninvite them. You could, it's your wedding guys. It's your wedding. Um, just be prepared for the blowback because it will happen. So, but don't be afraid of the blowback because if they're breaking boundaries and being stupid, and it sounds like your mom's kind of breaking boundaries and being stupid, you have a right to have your own wedding the way you want it. You do. You have a right to cancel it and elope. You do or do whatever you need to do. So, cause it's your wedding. It is your wedding. Absolutely. Where is, did I, I lost. Oh, so shameless plug. Um, these are available on Amazon. I also have them on audible. This one, I talk about my wedding <laughs> with Sean cause my mom played all sorts of games. So similar, different, but similar. Um, so this one is about why people get involved in relationships and abusive relationships and some stay and some don't. So these are both available on Amazon. They're also available on the Mercury slash 
mercury.com slash shop because I can autograph them there, but on Amazon, obviously not, and Audible if you want to listen to it. So there is that. Um, so yeah, you have a right to have your own wedding. If, if you don't want these people here, maybe you should cancel the wedding and then go alone. That's one way to do it. Um, if you are interested in salvaging a relationship with your mother, you may want to get a therapist and do a family session and figure out what the fuck. If she is disordered, then you go no contact. Do you see where I'm going with that? It's your wedding, guys. You have a right to have your wedding the way you want it. If you don't want his family there and he doesn't want his family there, then cancel the wedding and elope. That would be the easiest way to do it. So... And then if you do want a relationship with your mom, you need to figure out she needs to understand she crossed a major line and that's not okay. And, you know, get a therapist, work it through. All right, let's see. My ex-boyfriend and I live together. We, my ex-boyfriend and I live together. We purchased a home and shortly after moving in, he decided he wanted to be polyamorous. Now he claims to want monogamy after seeing someone else. Is he likely to be abusive if we start dating again? Well, was he abusive before? I don't know. I'm not a mind reader. I can't tell you. I, I don't know what the situation is. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I cannot tell you. I have no idea because was he abusive before? Did he call you names? Did he put you down? Did he, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there is this whole thing now of, you know, in, in the old days when dinosaurs were walking the earth, um, polyamorism was not the norm. Polyamorism is kind of now the norm. There's, there's, you know, you, you get with people, you don't get with people. So it may or may not be cheating. <sighs> you know, it's, there's uh, such a huge subject. So, um, so I really can't tell you. I mean, if, if now, if he decided he wanted to go see this other person and didn't tell you about it, and was cheating on you with them, then yeah, that's abusive. But if he said, Hey, I realized that I'm polyamorous and I, I don't want to be in a monogamous relationship and then you guys broke up. That's different. So, um, yeah, I can't tell you. You're, you're, I, you, if I, I don't know, I don't know. So, but again, trust is a huge issue. And if, if he was kind of hinky the way he did it, then no, you can't trust him. But if it wasn't hinky the way he did it, then you guys need to talk. And if you do decide to get back together again, I would definitely get with a therapist and work this through. And if anything you say in therapy is used against you, then you know you're with an abuser. So if that was abuse, then no, don't get back together with him. And why are you living with him? So, um, I mean, I know you purchased a home, but um, yeah. And this is this is a this is a scary situation because it's like you know when when we get with an let's say, let's just say that a person is abusive. Okay, I'm not saying your boyfriend is. I have no idea. But let's just say that they're abusive. Let's just say that a boyfriend is abusive or a girlfriend is abusive and they convince the other person to buy a home. Well, now that person is financially stuck to them for 30 years. That's what they do. It's the same thing as getting pregnant immediately. It's the same thing as, you know, investments immediately. It's like, you know, getting them stuck. So if you guys are not together and if you felt like this was a cheat, like it was cheating on you, then no, don't get back together with them. Absolutely not. That's just asking for trouble. Okay. My covert narcissist ex-husband left me for another woman and now they are getting married. He says he no he's no longer a narcissist. <laughs> I'm sorry. Give me a moment. What the fuck? Yes, I am in therapy and taking a year to fix me. Is there hope for me getting past this? Yeah, absolutely. You know, here's the thing. Narcissists are so not self-aware. So incredibly not self-aware. They, <laughs> they will get with somebody new and they'll be like, oh, I'm a better person. Oh, I'm this. Oh, I'm that. Oh, I'm sun changed. I'm, you know, I'm healed. I'm this, I'm that. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, the leopard does not change its spots. So, um, you got to find the humor. You just, you just kind of got to go, what the fuck? And laugh at it because they, yeah, nope, wrong, eh, incorrect response. I am truly hoping that you have no children together so that you don't have to stay in touch with this bozo. So if you, if you can go absolutely no contact, if you can't, you stay minimal contact, minimal contact. Okay. That is the best way to do that. Okay, last question. And while we're on that, okay, another shameless plug for Susanna Quintana. If you are having to do emails back and forth with exes, 
get a hold of Susanna Quintana, SusannaQuintana.com, SusannaQuintana.com. She's your girl because that's her expertise. She can help you plow through emails and stuff like that and help you go no contact. If you do not have to have contact with these people, don't go no contact. It's life is so much better that way. It's so much easier. And, and then when bullshit like that happens, you can laugh. Getting a sense of humor about it is really huge. When you can laugh at that shit, you're on your way. Do you see where I'm going with that? Okay, last question of the day. And then next week, I am going to do part two. I want to do more of the list of what a healthy relationship is because I don't think we talk about this enough. So, okay, this is the last question. How do I deal with the feeling that I'm not good enough? Okay, this is what every abuser does to us is they make us feel or they tell us that we're not good enough, not good enough, not good enough, not good enough, not good enough. And then it becomes our internal dialogue. Not good enough, not good enough, not good enough, not good enough. So you've got to get the self-esteem workbook. You've got to get with a good trauma therapist and you've got to start challenging the not good enough stuff. Oh, really? You think I'm not good? Well, thank you for your input. Shut the fuck up. Why? Because I say so. You, you say so. I say so. I am good enough. And you're going to have to challenge it multiple times a day. This thing is going to pop up and be an asshole to you. So you got to put it down, replace it, put it down, replace it. You're going to journal. You're going to write and burn letters. You're going to get with a good trauma therapist and you're going to work with mirror work. So when you look in the mirror, you make eye contact with yourself and you say, hi, good to see you. Have a great day. I give you permission to like yourself and then walk out. That's it. That's it. That's all I want you to do. No big, long drama, dialogues, whatever. And this thing's going to pop up and it's going to go, no, 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 no. You don't like yourself. You're a terrible person. You're blah, blah, blah. You're not going to. Thank you for your input. Shut the fuck up. Why? Because I say so. I am good enough. Why? Because I fucking say so. You're going to have to get tough with this thing. You got to get tough with it. It's a bully. It's a bully. So you work on the self-esteem workbook with, by Glenn Schiraldi. You work on um, trauma and all of the messages that you got from your family of origin and, and or from an abuser that you dated, and you start challenging it. So when these things pop up, the other thing you can do besides mere work is get a piece of paper, write it out. Oh, okay. My internal critic says that I'm not good enough. Well, fuck you, internal critic. You're full of shit, motherfucker. Do you see where I'm going with that? And then you turn it out to the barbecue and burn it. And you just keep challenging it. And you just keep taking your power back. Why? Because you say so. You are the boss of that thought. It is not the thought, the boss of you. The thought is not the boss of you. It thinks it is. It's not. It's not. So you start taking your power back. You start writing it letters and telling it to fuck off. And you take your power back. Dear internal critic, fuck you. I'm not taking this anymore. How dare you? How fucking dare you? Who the fuck do you think you are? Do you see where I'm going with that? You don't get to live in my head one second more. I am evicting you. I am going to exercise your ass. Be gone, be gone, be gone. You know, you're not, you don't get to live here, fucker. You don't. Fuck you. Get out. Fuck you. Why? Because I say so. I am the boss. And you trot it out to the barbecue and you burn it. There you go. Okay, kids. So I'm going to call it good for today. I'm going to do a part two next week on um, healthy relationships and how not to sabotage because we do, we try. Um, I've got more lists that I definitely want to go over. Uh, the cruise is still on guys. I'm going to be there. Um, I think I'm flying in on the 5th of December and, um, I want to thank Thomas and company for watching at my house. Thank you very much and sending me pictures. That's going to be awesome. Um, so, uh, the cruise is the 6th through the 9th. And then I'm going to be doing a lecture in Orlando on the, I think it's the 14th, December 14th. So there is that. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you and meeting all of you. This is going to be awesome. We're going to be doing so much cool stuff. I'm going to teach you guys guided imagery. I want to sit down and introduce you to your inner child. And I'm going to take you on a little journey of you, which is going to be awesome. I'm so looking forward to that. We're going to do mirror work. We're going to do journaling. We're going to do all sorts of cool things. And we get to have lunch and dinner together, which is so cool because then we can just sit and talk and process and we can talk about whatever needs to be talked about. So, and we get to see the Bahamas. So I'm excited about that because I love touring and I love traveling. All right, kids. I think that is it. Cannot think of anything else. You guys go have a wonderful, wonderful weekend or week or whatever we are on. I know we're on Sunday, but have a wonderful week. I'll see you next week. We're going to do part two next week. Now I got to find my cursor. There it was. Okay. Have a great time, guys. Love you. Bye.